Hey guys, it's Dave and Dorr, Tactical Hive. In today's video, we're gonna be going over nods, just the nods we used during our career and how we ran them. Up next. Hey guys, this video is brought to you by Letter Holsters. They're an American-made company that make really high quality holsters. They can fit you for almost any make or model of holster or gun you have out there. So if you're in the market for a new holster, give them a check in the description down below. We'd also like to give a shout out and a big thanks to our other sponsors, Dry Fire Mag and CCW Safe. You know, these are the companies that are giving you this content for free. Welcome back, guys. All right, so we're back. We've paid the bills. Yes. I told you slyly what it is we're here to do, which is talk about night vision. You know, this stuff's been around for quite a while. It's gone through a few generations, I know, always improving. But, um, you know, starting out, you know, how prevalent and common was night vision? When I was in private, one, in, one, in, one guy in a squad would have it. And then it was like the old PVS Anvis 5. It was like a TV mount sucked to your face and I could probably see better naked eyed to yeah. be honest they were, they were pretty they were pretty bad yeah and I noticed you know coming in nods you know were a, a common thing by the time I came around the mid-2000s but starting off in GWAT you know using nods was not as common or prevalent as it is now or even by the end of the 2000s the first time i saw nods i first time i remember seeing nods when they were super cool and super tactical mm -hmm. honestly would you remember that movie patriot games yeah with harrison ford and that irish hit, hit squad was in there yeah. first time i ever saw it we were like man that's super cool right yeah and it was yeah it's like, it was these in wetsuits like they knew what they were doing yeah and uh, in fact those were the first set of real nods i had as a private yeah. the old the old pvs sevens uh and those were so it had a monocular up front like this that came back to dual tubes in the back, right? Mm -hmm. Couldn't move them, couldn't function them. Um, I don't think they, if I remember correctly, they didn't even have gain, which we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but I don't think they even had gain. It was yeah. just ah, all bright in your eyes. I, I never got issued those, but I did see them around. Um, different forces had them kind of early on in my career. I know a partner force, we issued them out. They were the seven deltas, yep, which are supposed to be the clearest kind. But yep. yeah, basically you've got that mono view on dual, yeah, dual living in a dual world, but on a mono budget <laughs> yeah. is basically what that was. But you had to start somewhere, and um, yeah, the first kind of the one you had that you really got use out of was the PVS 14s, and these were yeah. the first ones were green. Almost now everything's that was green phosphorus inside the tubes. Uh, everything for the most part now is white. Now, granted, on the civilian market, you can buy green or white, mm -hmm. and I'll be the first to tell you, I, I, I've used them. I've used them all. I know how to use them. I use them at length, just like you. Mm -hmm. I'm not the smartest guy when it comes down to like, what's the FOM on this, yeah. or film versus unfilmed. I'm really not. You know, I tell you how to use them, but I have never really geeked out over them. No, no. They turn on and they focus, or they're shit and they get thrown away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but PBS 14s came out next, and... The cool thing with these, so it was monocular, um, and you had, I don't have a swing arm here because they always break. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Millette, you guys know I'm talking about. Uh, they always break, but the, you could adjust it for left eye or right eye, you know, off your helmets. And uh, it was one of the first times we had the opportunity, because this is also when the aim points and all that were out. It's the first time we had a chance to really understand what passive aiming would even look like, mm -hmm. you know, because now you can set it up to look through your unaided eye. But... Uh, the other nice thing about these when they first came out is, was, I think, pretty sure it was the first time we had a gain function. And so what gain is, when you're looking through your night vision, you can turn them full blast and they're like, they're taking all the light in. It is just, wah, into your eye sockets. Or you can turn them down so low, you're like, I don't can't even tell I have night vision on. Um, you got to find that kind of somewhere in the middle. I, For me, I found, I run it a little bit towards the lower settings um, and that doesn't wash out my eyes so bad. So my peripherals, outside of my night vision is a lot clearer and I can move better and, and quieter. What about you? Um, you know, it just, I really don't know until I get there. Um, you know, once you get to the same place, you're working in the same area, you know, things might stay the same, but you know, sometimes you're in a semi-lit environment, you know, obviously when the moon was full over there, it yeah. was the largest, most illuminated night you could, I mean, it, yeah. at some point, like it, it almost was dusk all night. Yeah. And then if there's no moon, it's pitch black. Yeah. You know, and if you're in an urban area without electricity and it's pitch black, I mean, I've been in situations where like you've got that turned all the way up, but it's still pixely. 
and hard to kind of see very far. Yep. It's like being in a cave. Um, you know, these things just amplify the light that already exists. Obviously, we have IR illuminators that can assist in that. But, um, you know, for me, we had the PVS 15s and then we also for whatever reason called the the, the mono a pvs 18. Huh. i don't know what the difference is or what you know the, on the civilian market and other services everybody refers to the mono version of the 15 as a 14 but for whatever reason we called it an 18 and it, you could take two 18s and turn them into a 50. yeah i've so seen that they're yeah. probably the same thing I, I don't really know that's big in the civilian market right now too yeah but we um starting out everybody got issued both a mono and a dual and you know this is the mid 2000s so the models were really starting to fade and the new generation was coming in and they were doing everything with binos and kind of the older generation that had however many years or decades of experience not really using night vision it was really kind of a they had to be it was it was a tough sell yeah because i'd heard stories about like the guys who went into afghanistan initially you know in 2001 even 2002 and they were going out at night with boomy hats on like they didn't want to bring their nods or their helmets because that's just not the way they trained. And, um, you know, that didn't last very long, but they just felt so confident in their ability to night fight without nods <laughs> that they just, I swear to God, I mean, I'm like, yeah, they're, I know, they're yeah. telling me these stories. And um, by the time I deployed for the first time in 2005, like everybody was running nods for everything. Um, pretty much always used the duels, but I did sometimes use the mono, but that was when I was um, running a machine gun or I was uh, maybe a turret gunner or doing one of those machine gun rolls in an urban environment where there was lots of light. I'll tell you my, uh, those funny stories, right? So um, my time in Bravo Company 3rd Range Battalion, which was the Somali, Somali, mm -hmm. Somalia, Operation Gothic Serpent, you know, the big lesson learned, which was it's a daytime mission. You don't need those, you know, shit cam. They didn't bring them. So um, yeah. the adverse knee, knee, you know, the knee jerk effect of that is You'll always have them with you. Uh, yeah, that the full value and the monumentous advantage that they would have had that night had they brought them. But you know, that just goes back to leadership and less again, learned. the leadership's even older than they are. That happened in nineteen ninety three. So the the huge advantage and the must have of nods, you know, it really took a while for that to really take hold because the military doesn't the, the, the wheel does not move. turn slowly. It, it turns very slowly. Yeah. And uh, just because you're at the tip of the spear or whatever, you know, yeah, it might turn a little faster, but doesn't not as fast as it's turning on the civilian side. And on the civilian side, man, you're really starting to see an uptake in nod ownership. Yes. You know, we teach a lot of classes. We do. We have, we have taught, I think, one nods class. Yeah. That was the night of the hurricane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the first hurricane in San Diego history, or whatever. That uh, we definitely saw that like. Everybody had different make model nods. Everybody had different make model lasers and you know, that's okay. So it's really on you, you know, at home to really take the time to figure out, you know, what makes your particular units run because it's going to be a little bit different for everybody, but there's obviously some commonality, you know, a nod is a nod. It attaches to the helmet the same way. And, uh, you know, we're going to get into a little bit of the more tips and tricks of the attachments for the nods and then how to attach them to yourself and keep them that way. Let's talk about some of the examples we got. Yeah. So we went to 14s and then, you know, the early 2000s, we went to du dual tubes, real legit dual tubes, right? Like these are the old, these are the old uh, PBS fives, the Anvis, they were the Anvis fives, right? And uh, the nice thing about these dual tubes were they were dual tube. It was the first time we actually had a real dual tube um, going from a monocular, right? The, the limitations to them is like you have to adjust them left and right. You have these adjustment wheels left and right to get it spaced off your head just right, you know? Mm -hmm. And we didn't have the Wilcox mouse at that time. Wilcox, there's a lot of mounts out there, right? But Wilcox has become the mount that we all use because of all the different points of articulation. I can articulate this this way, in and out, up and down. We were really limited on our on our the way we would mount them mm -hmm. and the way we wear them. So you, you get them fit on your helmet and you just have to walk with your helmet kicked back. <laughs> you know, it was a uh, quite a limiting factor. So yeah, then, you know, did a few, we did a few deployments with these PBS 15s. They're seriously a workhorse and they have a lot of cool functions on them. They have not one, but two on buttons. <laughs> you notice that you can click it twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has the IR flood on the front, which is great for uh, signaling and nonverbal communication, loss of comms plan. That's something that uh, the 
pre the later generations didn't have. And uh, you can get through definitely a full cycle of darkness on one AA battery. Um, you know, the covers, sacrificial lenses and stuff like that we have. They came out with all types of bells and whistles for these things. And you just kind of had to pick and choose what you wanted. The, uh, the sacrificial lenses were great because it, it protected the nods from getting scratched up and beat up. But if you weren't careful, you know, you, you had to keep, you didn't want any uh, liquid or humidity or anything like that getting in there. Generally, we worked in dry environments, but um, so it wasn't so much of an issue, but you had to keep them clean. You know, you wanted to make sure you maintenance these things. You know, the better you take care of your gear, the better your gear will take care of you. And, you know, these are mission essential and even crucial pieces of kit. So, you know, having those covers on there, great idea. You know, always having extra batteries on your first line gear, a must, because there's no way to tell just how charged that battery is. Um, but, you know, those are all kind of lessons learned we picked up and they were universal. Did you guys ever pop holes in the Absolutely. rubber covers? Yeah, the rubber, even the plastic ones, we'd even take the plastic ones and, and burn a hole in them. Yeah. Yep. Guys would do that as well. Um, you know, definitely if it was super dark, that could cause issues. But um, for helo operations and stuff like that, breaching, um, they were there was just an, another added layer of protection. And, you know, these are super expensive, you know, especially when you're paying your own money, which is something I've been getting used to. And, um, <laughs> you know, you want to take care of your gear. So, you know, spend a little bit of time, a little bit of money on having those sacrificial lenses, having good covers. And lanyards guys being able to lanyard your helm your nods to your helmet is a must you know we've got uh, a lot of examples and um of the uh the anchor you know the anchor points you know the retention uh clips not just two the we clip these right into the uh, the helmet and they they keep the nods from shaking around as you're walking gets rid of that wobble that's pretty much universal and i think all helmets come with that yeah but um you know 15 or so years ago wow the old mounts were super, super wobbly. The new Wilcox yeah. mounts are pretty, pretty tight. You know, these are, these 31s here, <clears throat> I don't run. You can see where they have these, the, the anchors now on the back. They come built in with it so you can clip in. They're mm -hmm. made that way now. Um, but yeah. uh, I, I find that I don't need them anymore with these, with these new mounts. These 31s were the first time we had like the nice articulating arms yeah. and everything else, which made life so much nicer, you know. Um, and this is actually the first White Foss, White Foster's knobs that, that we had. Mm -hmm. What I liked about these, now we had the Anvis sixes, which had the battery packs in the back. Mm -hmm. And gosh, we needed those because, man, they were so heavy. Like you were just so brown bound, you know, mm -hmm. that the old, the old BBS fives, remember how heavy they were? And like guys would take dive weights and put dive weights in the back of their helmet to counter up balance their helmet. So you weren't walking around yeah. front loaded. It enhances the aging process. For sure. But yeah, counterweights on helmets were common. Some guys would stick like mags back there. Yep. Uh, the battery packs do help, but they're not really a counterweight, I would say. But it's better than nothing, especially on a bump helmet. Um, but the more modern chin strap, you know, retention systems for the helmets would start to count, would start to, you know, take that into account. But yeah, you just got to kind of figure out what works for you. All these, all these old nods too, or I say old nods, the, the previous generation nods all have some type of switch like this on them, right? The problem with these switches that we have found over and over and over is they come off. They, they rip off, they come off, and you're trying to articulate this little flat button best you can, you know, while you get back. The new 31s don't have that. They have, you just push that button down in the center to turn it on, and you push and hold it, mm -hmm. and then you push and hold to turn it off. And your gain is now inside here, so that's your gain and your power all in one right there. Makes it, uh, makes it a lot nicer. They have limiters on it now, so if I got my nods set where I want them, and I'm cranking them up, and I'm cranking them down all night long, I'm not constantly trying to, like, finesse them. They have these little screws that uh, allow you to finesse and set that that optional right right where you want it. Perfect for you all the time, every time. I'm a big fan. Yeah, it definitely makes life a lot easier just getting them on and off. We run the, they run these battery packs with them. So that's the battery pack for the 31. And you know it holds four additional AA batteries in there. It's just an additional power source for it. Makes it run longer. For us, we just shove it underneath our, our helmet covers. And there's no rhyme or reason on how we run that wire, you know, underneath. Just we just basically it's keeping it out of the way for us. Yeah. Um, but when we're mounting these nods, you can see these. Well, now they're no longer new, but the, when these first came out, like these were the the heat, these triangular style. Remember, they had the old lever action style piece, which had all the wobble in the mount. So to take that wobble out, they came with these flat mounting designs that just literally lock in. So once that locks is mounted, you just take your additional power scored and then just like everything in the army 
it's got directions. So the white button goes to white button. So you ain't trying to smash that Hulk smash strong ranger, you know, until you where it goes. And you give it a little tug, make sure it's set. And uh, now I'm good to go. Last thing I'm gonna do with that set of nods is I'm going to secure it to my tie down. All right, so they're tied off, they're out of the way, and they're ready, they're powered up, ready to go. Um, on these filters here, you see have a couple of different sort of like, like doors talking about. There's there are sacrificial lenses, and there's uh, there's lenses that help you focus better, right? So sacrificial lenses, here's a bunch of different types, right? So in storage, when they go in the bag and they go into the arms room, whatever, they just go in these plastic cups for storage, right? Um, it just keeps them from getting scratched up. These are the front side sacrificial lenses. Um, and, and they're honestly, when I wasn't paying for them myself, I never use them. If my lenses got scratched up, I go get some new ones, new knots, right? Mm -hmm. But now that I'm paying for it myself, I use these a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the backside sacrificial lenses, again, never used them until I started paying for it for myself. So now they all run them. Um, what nice for these things right here, huh. you know what I do with these things? I take them into the kitchen, open up my trash can, and I throw them in. Yeah. You know, these yeah. are technically uh, like uh, they're shades. Shades. Like, when you, I like that to, to block any light escaping to keep you hidden. But they also block is the ability from the heat of your body to get away from the lens of your nods. So they will cause sweating and they'll get foggy and it, they're just they're just terrible and they also kill all of your peripheral vision i was uh, saying earlier about turning your gain down turning my gain down allows me to see an obstacle up there that i counter later on and then see it under my peripheral vision and still walk over it with these on you don't see it so uh, but bringing those with you you know you get to a, a point where you don't want to be observed but you need to observe it and you're using the see that. so having those you know in a wrecking capacity they were used um yeah. a little bit and then Grab, you know, like non-standard mobility, side by sides and things like that. You can slow creep those things, but at a pretty good distance on a dark night, you can start really start to see the glow of the nod back on yeah, the face. That's a good because point. nobody wears face paint anymore. And the reflection and that glow of the nod on your face, you can see under the right conditions fairly far away, especially if it's moving. And that's something that I noticed. So you know, being caught, being aware of that, you know, if you don't want to be observed and, you know, it's kind of hard to be sneaky in a gas powered or diesel powered mobility platform. But if you're slow roll into a target, which did happen where you'd literally just take your foot off the gas and slow roll up because of the, how open it was. And, you know, there really wasn't much between the target building and anything else because of how rural it was. That's the kind of stuff you really got to start to geek out on. And I know we're getting pretty far into the tactical rabbit hole there, but, um, you know, just having options and not needing, you know, the need and not have when it comes to this kind of stuff. Because when you need it, you're probably pretty far from, you know, your yeah. ability to get things delivered by Amazon. He's, they're working on it, I swear. Your, but, the, um, the order's been processed. Yeah, the order, the order will process faster. But, you know, just, you know, really try to A to Z map out what you're going to be doing and which bells and whistles, you know, you're going to want. Those sacrificial lenses, you know, that can end up saving you a lot of money and then proper storage. And then even these right here, these are red lenses and these are sacrificial and they fit on the back. And these are just designed to try to cut down on that light signature reflected off of your face. They also will keep, um, you know, the splashing of the rain and the waves off of the actual knot itself. They do a pretty good job of that though. They are not swimmable and just, you know, just, there's just different stuff out there. The biggest problem I see when guys, I, you know, working with guys with night vision for the first time or guys who haven't spent a lot of time under night vision, their biggest problem, I know mean, they'll have night, nice gear <coughs> and they'll be out there and they're like, man, I can't see and I can't see this. And I can't, I've taught a lot of nighttime classes for shooting long range on the law enforcement side. And uh, from department to department to department, I'm always surprised to find like, yeah, like they all have PBS fives or PBS 31s, but 31s to 31s to 31s are not all the same. You know, it, it's weird, you know, um, but anyway, uh, the common problem i see the most is they don't know how to focus them and these things guys if you haven't spent a lot of time on them so there's a there's a gross adjustment in the back there's a fine adjustment in the front right and having those things worked out so that they both mirror up with your eyes and you get a good clear image is one of the hardest things to do that you're only going to learn under time but it turns out like it's a little it's when you really literally work on one eye at a time so it's i'm adjusting this eye a little bit I'm adjusting that eye a little bit. And what I'll do, my technique is, 
I'll find something close. Like, I'll find something 25, 30 meters away. Mm. Sticks in a skyline or something like that works well. Something with sharp edges. And I'll focus on that, just going back and forth with that one little eye until it's perfect. Then I'll work on this eye and I'll do the exact same thing until it looks perfect. I open both my eyes and I see where the adjustments are and then I can tweak it, mm. you know. Um, one of the hardest things because when, once you've got a good, once these things are nice and, and clear for you, and it's usually a distance. Up close, you can't see anything with these. It's blurry. Me and Dora walk up to each other face to face. Hey, Dora. Hey, mm. Dave. Like, it, we're all blurry, right? Well, on the assault or something like that or a place where like you need to be able to see far and see cl close clearly, um, a little hack, like he said, we used to do is we used to drill the holes in these little, we'd burn fill a hole. That little hole obviously reduces the effectiveness of the, of the night vision device, uh -huh. but it allows that almost like um, infinity level of, of focus, right? I can see close, I can look out and see far. So granted, trying to pull these off when you need the nod to work to its optimal capacity is not tactically sound. So companies came out with stuff like this. This is just one. There's a couple of them that kind of close like a like an iris, you know. Um, this is made by Focus, and uh, all this is is I can clap it over. Now I have a small little pinhole. The focus on this now is going to be from here to infinity for the most part. But again, like I said, it reduces the efficiency of the night vision device as it's designed to happen. So anyway. there's a whole bunch of these types out there. Commercial markets you can make your own. Like I said, we made our own. And, uh, you know, necessity drove invention. And now we have all these new different aftermarket products, which are out there pretty cool. Yeah, starting out, you know, with nods, you're going to lose that peripheral vision, which is why it's so important to train as if you are on night vision you, or you are in that low visibility environment, you know, as far as how you set up your kit, how you get in and out of your kit. But one trick that I saw the people using early on as they were learning how to use night vision is you know, their dominant eye, they would focus far, and then their non-dominant eye, they would focus you know up close so that they would be able to see things up close a little more, more better. <laughs> but that's not something I recommend. Yeah, this is a long time ago before a lot of what Dave was just talking about was figured out. But yeah, having that autofocus capability and then just being able to rely on muscle memory and coordination and being able to just kind of work off of your person and work up close with your hands and not necessarily be able to see all that well because you know if you're, if you're wearing nods you know it's probably a very dark environment the last thing you want to do is start breaking out lights all right guys so next thing let's talk about uh the points of articulation on how we mount our nods and how we wear our nods in our face like some lessons learned right and these are these are hundreds and hundreds of hours of time under night observation devices learning this stuff out right so here's the cheat codes to how to wear your nods um, first of all, new nods mounts, <clears throat> they're so much better than their predecessors, right? Again, we continue to learn more and more and more. Uh, this is the new, one of the newest and greatest, latest fads out there. Well, I say newest, latest. These have been out for quite some time. These have been out 15 years, probably now, at least 15, 12. Yeah. But the nice thing about these, this has, this has three different points of articulation on it, right? So first thing is I can move this nod up and down. All right, so once my helmet's fitted where I want my helmet's comfortable, I can move the nods up and down so that I can see out them correctly. And I lock it down, easy lockdown. Next nice thing about this is I can change the orientation of the nods up and down. And this with this little nod right here, go down some, go up some. Typically what I've found is you almost never wear them down unless you're wearing your helmet back like that. And it's not something really we ever do, so. They're almost always ran up like that and we adjust it up and down. And then the last thing, which again is wildly important, is in or out, how far away I wear it from my face. And like we were saying previously, you know, I don't want to use those eye cups. I want those nods off of my eyes a little bit to give me that peripheral. I don't want them so far out there that it's like ridiculous. Yeah. You know, I want to be able to see as much as I can see. So I find that like about one third of the way back for me is about where I set mine up. And that gives me about an inch and a half, inch and a quarter from my eyeball, probably to the back of my ocular lens. Yeah, it's also going to depend, uh, you know, what kind of eye pro you're wearing. If you are wearing eye pro, you probably are, at least especially for training. But um, yeah, you got to kind of find that sweet spot. Having your nods contact the lenses of your eye pro is not the deal. Uh, they're going to be close. So you got to find that sweet spot of what works for you. Mm hmm. All right, up next, guys, we have the retention system. And this is a, uh, you know, a Maritime Fast helmet, which is just a ridiculously expensive skateboarding helmet. 
And um, it came with, you know, these retention straps. Is that what I'm gonna call these right there? Yeah, bungees. Bungees, these bungees, which are made for retention. And the idea behind them is they would keep the, the nods from wobbling and keep them from falling off if, in the event your, uh, your freaking mount got knocked off, your nods got knocked off of your mount because that can happen. But these don't lock. So for maritime and air operation, these aren't good enough. So we would just automatically add a second set that had the, uh, the clip on locking. And these acted as your lanyard and they just kind of helped keep them more secure into your face. I did have them knocked off once and they were dangling by the freaking bungees. <laughs> I don't remember why. Must have fallen. But, um, you know, always a good idea to have these things, you know, lanyarded onto the, the helmet. And, you know, if you're running dual clips, that each one of them is its own independent lanyard. Um, I even ran little mini keychain rings uh, on these just to make it a little bit easier to get on and off. I like that. But, yeah. And it's just a really good idea. The covers are going to be you know, semi-permanently attached. I'm not going to take them off just because I'm using them because I want to be able to cover them up, put them back in my pocket. If I was going out into the field and it warranted helmet and plates, I was bringing my knots. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've spoken to that in other videos. Like I've got that um, general purpose machine gun pouch on the back left um, side of my body. And that's generally where the nods would go. And they make these little padded uh, foam form fitted cases that go right into the 60 pouches. Um, that's a, just a ginormous, ginormous one, yeah. They make a, neck down, but they make neck smaller ones that are just you know, give a little added protection. And if you got to, you know, get creative, get creative and, you know, really take care of these things because, uh, you know, they're very expensive and they're very important to have when you need them. A lot of guys would just store their nods in their rifle cases in like Crown Royal bags. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of Crown Royal overseas. Stuff. Green apple. Yeah. <laughs> green apple. I'm different. I have green apple. <laughs> you guys are all using the standard ones because you're basic mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, just kind of figure this out, teach their own. You see Dave and I use things like IR glint tape and put strobes on our helmets. You know, that kind of stuff's important. Though, you know, by the end of the 2000s, the farther we got into the 2010s, you know, opposition having nods and Sabon became more and more and more of a thing. Very so, cool. you know, having these bright illuminator flags on your helmet, um, you know, depending on when where you were, you know, what AO you were working with, who you were working against, you know, that kind of stuff went away. Um, maybe having a little bit of glint tape on the very top of your helmet because they don't have aircraft, not the end of the world. But um, definitely when you're setting up your stuff, be ready for, you know, potential opposition to have the same capability. We're all living in that spoiled brat. We, we don't world. own the night. Anymore. We don't own the night anymore like we did electronically. Those were, because uh, I'll tell you what, in the 2000s, you know, my first couple of deployments, you could be as just ri ridiculously, you know, liberal, whatever you want to call it, with your IR lights, you know, and nobody cared. But uh, that came to a screeching halt towards the end of that decade. And we started treating IR lasers and light like it was white light. And that continued to become more and more of a thing. So, you know, be ready for that. Definitely have the ability to, you know, keep these things up and running, maintenance them, you know, extra batteries, of course. Make sure you have them lined up on your face so that you can see that low battery indicator. Because uh, I was driving through the night one time, long, long time ago. And I'm in an armored vehicle, so I could care less about even wearing my helmet. But I had to have them for the nod. So, you know, I was kind of moving the helmet around on my head because it was uncomfortable. And I somehow, some way, covered up that low battery indicator. <laughs> And we, uh, we ended up coming to a stop. I think it was uh, for like... For those guys that may not know. So... Yeah. The low battery indicator, he's running off of the battery pack back here. Yeah. And so built for like, built initially built for aviation guys, guys flying helicopters. We're like, you know, if your nods die, it's a big, it's a big deal. Big deal. Right. So there's a switch back there. You can just switch to the next battery pack and have continued power, but it gives you a warning. Yeah. Apparently my boy door didn't see. So I was not running <laughs> a battery pack on that setup. I think it was just running off the single battery. Oh, okay. It serves. It was our pair of, it was a pair of 15s. Oh, gotcha. This is like just 2000. 2000. Seven, eight, seven. Yeah. But anyway, I, you know, eventually I moved my head around and saw that I didn't have a yellow light. I had a red light and I think a red is like less than an hour left, but we were stopped anyway, because we were in the middle of absolute nowhere doing overlanding stuff. And uh, I was just, you know, swapped out, no big deal. On that same deployment, we were leaving a DA. We were tearing through town in a hurry and I had my nods completely fail. 
the DA, sh- DA is direct action. Direct action. Uh, I, we did it. We were doing a hit, and I was driving us out of town. A few few trucks, and then my nods completely failed. I was driving the truck that my chief was in, so he's riding shotgun. He's on cause, make sure everybody's. You know, we're doing a rolling head count as we're getting ready to step off. I think we're probably through that process because we were now driving quickly, and uh, I had I had two things to tell him. I had good news and I had bad news. <laughs> And uh, the good news was that my nods had completely shit the bed. They had died. And this is right, kind of right before we got the 31s, like not far after. So they were really stretching the use of the 15s out before they swapped them out. But the good news was that there was enough of a slit in the back taillights of the truck in front of me (laughs) that I could just see the two little red spots in front of me and I could follow them. (laughs) So we made it out. But eventually somebody in the back gave me their nods and I drove us back to the base. But um, yeah, these things do fail. Um, they do have their limitations, so take care of them. I've also had them shut off on me due to explosions uh, many, many times. So if you get too close to an explosion, which is not something that you should be doing in the first place, uh, nods have a tendency to blink. And sometimes if the explosion is strong enough, the nods will just shut themselves off. And I think that's some kind of a safety feature. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, except for that one time, they always came back on. I'll so. tell you this, if you're new to nods and you purchase a pair of night vision, right? So something the guys that are new to it don't really think about, you can ruin a pair of these in a heartbeat by turning them on and wearing them in the daytime without any covers. You can naturally destroy a pair of nods like that. At nighttime, you can destroy a pair of nods by staring at one bright light for way too long. And you'll see when you look away from it, you'll start, you'll see these little streaks in your screen. Now, those little streaks will eventually kind of clear themselves out for the most part, I found. But if you just stare at it or a super bright light, you will, uh, again, uh, be looking to buy a new set of nods. So, know that. Yeah, definitely some more do's and don'ts. I'll tell you this, guys. Like everything else we say, we, we say it here at Tactical Hive again and again and again. Train. Go train. Go train. Go train. And again, you don't have to go to the range with these every single time and make it, you know. You can take a walk to the woods. Yeah. You know, you can definitely walking on nods just going on a a, a leisurely stroll or any kind of hiking especially like it takes some getting used to because you cannot see your feet and you generally won't be able to see the ground right in front of you so you are you know looking ahead for obstruction things that you're going to be tripping over you're going to have to start looking a little bit farther ahead planning a little farther ahead and you do not want to be uncomfortable or uncoordinated on night vision at any kind of even close to live fire training and most people that own this stuff are just like most people that own guns. They just go to the range, stand still generally, and just shoot a bunch and say they're training. And if that's that's you, then cool, whatever. But in real life, where real two-way th- range things happen, there's a lot of running around, moving around, climbing, falling, slipping, cursing. And you definitely want to have your coordination in check. You definitely want to be familiar with moving around um, on nods before you get into any kind of live fire training because it's going to make it horrendously dangerous, especially if you're moving around. Mm. Uh, the funny thing I say at nighttime is every time we run a night range is uh, for whatever reason, when the sun goes down, people lose their minds, right? Mm-hmm. And our common thing is like, what? I can't hear you. I have on night vision, right? Like people's minds just shut down, right? Um, man, start on your house. You know your house like the back of your hand. You walk through your house all the time. If you have a two-story house, even better, Right? But, you know, walk, turn the lights out of the house and walk up your stairs, down your stairs, walk around your living room, walk into your garage and retrieve something specific, you know, learn how to use those focus up close and back and forth. I'm just, ultimately what I'm getting at guys and I'm beating a dead horse on is go train, train with yourself. You spent the money for it, go train with it. Yeah. And just making sure even before you, yeah. And just me and, and the training, like we said, can just be familiarization, yeah. walking around, yeah. walking around the house. Yep. Yeah, doesn't have to be super, you know? super high. Go lay meal on nods. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or not, you know. Maybe just make a sandwich first, you know. Let's 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 step up that complexity so we don't burn the place down. But anyway, guys, you know, we just kind of wanted to make a quick video. We had this stuff out here, and um, you know, there's a little bit of a how and a why, and, and we take it for granted because we just did so much on nods for so long, and we were both present for that. I mean, I've been pretty much all of GWAT, but freaking, you know, from the beginning in 2001 to the the end and the late, the early twenties, you know, call it a 20 year period. Um, there was just so much innovation and there was just so many, you know, tricks and hacks and whatever you want to call it. And, um, it really makes life a lot easier. Hey guys, check it out. If you got your own setups, 
or you have questions about it, listen, again, if it's a super technical question, don't ask me. I don't know, right? Call, call the company. I don't know. Um, but if you got questions about kits set up or how ways to run your stuff or things like that, you know, comment that stuff. Let us know. Hit us up. You know, we may have a solution for you or at least uh, maybe what a not to do, which will at least point you in the direction of where you shouldn't be going. And if you want a deeper conversation on something like this, you know, uh, check out uh, our war room. That gives you direct access to all the subject matter experts. And uh, it is really a collaborative process uh, where all of us like-minded people get together uh, daily and weekly uh, to discuss things. But it's direct access. So check it out if that's something you want. All right, guys. Catch you next time. All right.